To all intents and purposes, these eight-a-day clocks look little different from many long case clocks of the period. Apart from some curious little wings that project from the sides of the trunk. But when we remove the hood, we immediately begin to see that these clocks are something out of the ordinary. Now we can clearly see the massive construction of the wooden movement as compared with the conventional brass and steel movement of the period. The movement fits very closely inside the hood of the clock and in fact we can see that the movement is actually wider than the dial back plate. With the dial removed we can begin to see some more of the unusual features of these movements. All the pivot holes are bushed with lignum vitae to remove the need for lubrication and we can see how the arbor of the scape wheel rotates on anti-friction rollers made of the same material. A peep further inside will show the grasshopper escapement working, although it is quite difficult to see what is actually happening in this clock. However, if we study the action of the grasshopper escapement from this skeleton clock, all should become clearer. If you watch the action of the pallet very carefully, you can see how it is actually pushed by the scape wheel tooth until the other pallet engages the wheel and causes it to recoil. The working pallet immediately jumps clear of the wheel tooth and there is no sliding friction, so again no need for lubrication. Friction in the movement is further reduced by the special design of wheel and pinion that Harrison used. Here it can be seen that the conventional fixed pinion leaves are replaced by small rollers of lignum vitae that rotate on fixed brass pins. As the wheel teeth press on the rollers, they move around the brass pins with a rolling movement. Again, we have pressure, but very little friction. So none of the wear associated with solid pinion leaves can occur. To give the wooden teeth equal strength, all are inserted as small segments into the oak centre of the wheel. This ensures that the grain runs radially through each tooth, making them much stronger than if cut directly from the wooden blank, which would result in some teeth having cross grain and thus being much weaker. However, the special features of the clock don't end there. The pendulum is hung with its suspension spring passing closely between these two adjustable cycloidal cheeks. Once assembled in the clock, the relationship of the two cheeks to each other can be minutely adjusted by means of the thumb screw visible in the picture. But more than that, it can be seen that screws are fitted that can vary the shape of each cheek very slightly. All of this was designed to provide the accurate timekeeping that Harrison was striving for. Harrison well knew that one of the biggest problems affecting the accurate timekeeping with clocks was variations in the length of the pendulum caused by changing temperature. He set out to eliminate this problem and designed, as his pendulum rod, a grid of alternate brass and steel bars. These were connected together in such a way that the differential expansion and contraction of the two metals cancelled each other out and the pendulum remained a constant length. This form of pendulum rod became known as a gridiron. How Harrison was able to determine with such accuracy the coefficient of expansion of different metals whilst working in a remote village in Lincolnshire remains something of a mystery. Here we can see the gridiron pendulum when the clock is working, and to eyes that have become accustomed to seeing accurate timekeepers whose pendulums make a very small arc of swing, the enormous amplitude will be immediately apparent. But it has several advantages. 
Firstly, it forces the suspension spring to wrap properly around the cycloidal cheeks and so ensures their effectiveness. Sweeping through the air so powerfully also ensures that the gridiron responds rapidly to temperature changes. It also lessens the effects on the pendulum of changes in air density. All these features combined to ensure the accuracy of the clock in the long term. The wide arc of swing also explained those strange little side boxes on the trunk. The swing of the pendulum is so wide that holes had to be cut in the side of the trunk to accommodate the edges of the pendulum bob, and these are covered by the little boxes. These clocks also incorporated another mechanism of Harrison's own design. When a weight driven clock is wound, the driving power is removed for a short time and so the clock loses a few seconds. To prevent this, and also to prevent damage to the escapement, Harrison devised a maintaining power system using a weighted lever which drives against the brass pins on one of the going train wheels. In these clocks, this maintaining power had to be set manually, but on later clocks Harrison refined it so that its action became automatic. By the year 1730, Harrison was well aware of the Longitude Prize and wrote up in detail his experimental work on accurate time measurement. He claimed that his wooden clocks would keep time to within one second a month and would rarely need cleaning. With his carefully prepared notes and plans, he set off for London in the hope of gaining support for his scheme to build an accurate seagoing timekeeper. From now on, to combat the rigours of ocean-going conditions, his main constructional materials would have to become brass and steel. And although he probably never made another wooden clock, this small group of remarkable timekeepers played a pivotal role in the development of reliable oceanic navigation in the future.